Good morning, everybody. It is good to see everybody here this morning. We're always grateful for your presence. We especially want to welcome those of you who might be visiting with us. Uh, we're always glad that you made the choice to come and be here. Uh, we know that you have choices on how to spend your time and even where to worship, and we're just glad you're here with us this morning. The story is told of a young couple that is getting married, and the bride-to-be is especially nervous. And so the preacher, wanting to be helpful, wants to try to find some way to encourage her. So he thinks to himself, I'm going to pick out a Bible verse that I think would be encouraging. So he picks out 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18, which says, There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. That's encouraging. That would be something encouraging to hear as you're getting ready to get married. So he goes to the best man and he tells the best man, he says, I want you to go to, to the bride-to-be, and I want you to read this verse to her. And I want you to tell her that a little later on in the, the sermon that I'm going to talk about this verse, and that I want her to be encouraged and not to be afraid this morning. So the best man agrees. He wants to be helpful, but he's also a little bit nervous. I mean, you can imagine he's got a job to do this morning and uh, the morning of the, the wedding. And so he grabs his Bible, and he hurries off to the bride-to-be, and he knocks on the door and he gets permission to come in and he's fumbling with his Bible and he opens it up and unfortunately he gets confused. And instead of opening it to 1 John, he opens his Bible to the Gospel of John. And he reads chapter 4 and verse 18 to her which says, For you have had five husbands and the one you are with now is not your husband. You know, the truth is we all need a word of encouragement sometimes, don't we? But you know, even well-intentioned people, we try to offer encouragement, but it sometimes is not encouraging, it can be discouraging. And we don't mean for it to be like that young man, we just sometimes get confused. And if you're like me, sometimes you just put your foot in your mouth, trying to say something encouraging. But here's the great thing. The great thing is God's Word always has the perfect encouragement. Did you know there's a book of the Bible that was written entirely as a word of encouragement? The Hebrews writer says in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 22, he describes what he's written as a word of exhortation. The entire letter that he wrote was meant to be words of encouragement to a group of people that were discouraged. People that were discouraged because they were facing difficulties or persecutions or they were just struggling in their faith, and they were Jews that had converted to Christianity, and they were getting so discouraged they just wanted to go back to Judaism. So the Hebrews writer writes this letter as a way to encourage them to not go back. This morning, I invite you to open your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to look at a small portion of this book, and we're going to see some words that I hope will encourage us this morning as we come together. Things that we need to be reminded of, but not just to be reminded of, but to continue to remind each other of when it comes to some of the blessings that we have available through Jesus. The first thing I want us to notice this morning is we need to be encouraged to draw near to God. Look at verse 19 of Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now let's just stop there before we go any further. And I want you to notice the very first word that I read to verse 19, that word, therefore. Now, I know most of us probably know this, but it's just a good reminder. Anytime we see that word when we're reading Scripture, we need to think, what was just said before this? Because the writer is actually pointing us back. He's connecting what has just been said to what he's about to say. So let's think about that for just a moment. The writer has just concluded a series of thoughts that were entirely based around Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. And he really started this discussion back in chapter 8 and verse 7. That's where this discussion started. And so he quotes Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. But then he goes on to expand upon this to try to make a really important point to this audience. 
So he talks about, in chapter 9, some aspects of the old law. He talks about the tabernacle and the things in the tabernacle. And he would talk about the sacrifices. But I want you to notice what he says in chapter 10 and verse 1. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Now, that's interesting. There's that same phrase, draw near. He says, otherwise, verse 2, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So now he's setting his audience up to make his point on this discussion from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. He tells him, he says, look, the old law was but a shadow. The elements of the old law, the things that made up that old law, they served a purpose, but they were never intended to be the ultimate destination. They were never going to be the real thing that solved the problem of sin. He said, otherwise, if it were, there wouldn't have been this need every year to keep going through this process of sacrifices because, you see, the day that he has in mind is the day of atonement. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But now drop down to verse number 9 in that same chapter. Then he added, Behold, I, meaning Jesus, have come to do your will. And notice what he says. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You see what he says? He says, that first covenant, all the things that made up that first covenant, they were important, they served a purpose, but they were a shadow. They weren't the real thing. They were pointing towards the real thing. That real thing came in the life, in the death, in the burial, in the resurrection of Jesus. And through that process, that first thing was done away with, and now this new second covenant has come into place. And because of that second covenant, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. That's just a small part, the highlight reel, we might say, of what he's been saying in chapters 8, chapters 9, and chapter 10 leading up to where we just read, beginning in verse 19. It's because of all of that we have this confidence, he says, to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, verse 19. Now I want you to think with me for just a moment. I want you to go back to the Old Testament with me and think about where God's presence dwelt amongst His people at different times. When the Israelites left Egypt, when they were freed from Egyptian bondage, and they were, in essence, we might call them vagabonds, they were living in tents, wandering in the wilderness, going towards the promised land. They didn't have permanent dwelling places. They would set up their camp, and God ultimately would deliver to them or give instructions to them on how to build what was called the tabernacle, a tent of meeting a place that was set up for His presence to dwell. And, and let's paint a picture in our minds of what that looked like. There would have been this outer courtyard wall, we might say, that was shaped kind of rectangularly. And then there would be an inner courtyard that had a place for washing and sacrifice. But then there was this tent within that outer courtyard. And that tent had two specific places to it, a holy place and a holy of holies, as it was called. And inside that Holy of Holies was the place where God's presence dwelt, where the Ark of the Covenant would be. And so the Israelites, as they would set up camp, the tabernacle would be in the center with that outer courtyard. And then the Levites would be divided into four different sections, three on each side, or two on each side of the tabernacle. And then the rest of the camp, three on each of the four sides, would set up their tents. So if you weren't of the tribe of Levi, you would be on the, the outside. There would be the tabernacle, then the tribes of Levi, and then ultimately your tent. So you were separated from the physical place of God's presence, of where He dwelled in that tabernacle, by various things. And so as an Israelite, you could come into the outer courtyard, you could enter that part, and you then were dependent upon a priest to take your sacrifice and go into the holy place. But even the priest couldn't go any further than that. Only the high priest, and then only once a year on the Day of Atonement, could enter the Holy of Holies to get to the place of God's presence where He dwelt. Now, fast forward. 
The Israelites have entered the promised land. They've entered the place, the land that God had promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The tabernacle would ultimately be replaced by the temple, a more permanent dwelling, residing in Jerusalem. The structure of it is still the same, two primary places, the holy place and the holy of holies. Now imagine if you were a tribe and your inheritance, your land inheritance, was a distance away from Jerusalem. You are now separated by distance and time to even get to Jerusalem, to the place where God's presence dwelt. So it required a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And then you still had the separation if you weren't a Levite, a priest, and then only the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement entered that holy of holy places. But the Hebrew writer says, but now everything's changed. Because of Jesus, because of his sacrifice, you, he's reminding his audience, have the ability with confidence to enter the holy places by the very blood of Jesus to enter the throne room of God. You're no longer separated by all those barriers. You have access to the throne room of God. Think about that for a moment. You no longer have to go through all the processes that were a part of the Old Testament. You're no longer dependent on a Levite priest. We're all priests. But here's this. We still have a high priest. But the Hebrews writer's been laying out this argument going all the way back to chapter 3 that it's this perfect high priest, now Jesus. And he's in the very right hand of God. So as we enter that throne room of God, we have the perfect high priest there. And he is interceding. He's pleading our case to God every time we go before him. That is an incredible word of encouragement. You don't need me to go to God. You don't need one of the elders to go to God. Every one of us in this room that have been joined together with Christ, we have this incredible ability to experience Him as our high priest, and we have access to God's throne room anytime we want. You see, that's the word of encouragement that the Hebrews writer is talking about. But let's keep reading. Verse 20, by this new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have this great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart. A true heart is what? It's one that believes in the power of this second covenant. In full assurance of faith, faith of the redemptive work of the cross and of Jesus. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. What does that mean? What's the Hebrews writer talking about there? Well, turn back with me to chapter 9. And let's read, beginning in verse 13. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of a defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You see, part of that old covenant, that old law, There were things that an individual might do that would make them what was called ceremonially unclean. They couldn't approach the very tabernacle or temple. And so one of the ways they could be made clean again was through this sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer and the sanctification for the purification of the flesh. And the Hebrews writer says, if that worked under the old law, how much better is this purification by the blood of Jesus? So he talks about our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Another way under the old law, if someone became unclean that they might become clean was through this ceremonial washing. If you've ever maybe seen pictures or if you've ever been fortunate enough to to go to Israel and see the ruins in Jerusalem, as you're standing there looking at old Jerusalem, one of the things you notice are these these kind of pits in the ground, and there's stairs that go down into this uh, area, and there's a divider. And so you would walk down on one side, and there would be water in this, this area, and they would wash themselves and then come up on the other side clean. They would be ceremonially clean. Well, that sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Looks a lot like a baptistry today, we might say. And see, that's the point. How much more, if that washing under the old law, if that made them clean, how much more is the washing that we experience through baptism or we experience the blood of Jesus and are joined to Him? How much better is that 
a cleansing us and making us clean. And it's through that whole process that we have this ability to draw near to God. But it's all because of the work of the cross in Jesus. So we need to be encouraged to draw near to God. But we also need to be encouraged to be faithful to Christ. Look at verse 23 with me back in Hebrews chapter 10. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. The confession of our hope. This is ultimately, this one verse is all about one thing. It's about who we pledge our allegiance to. You see, the Hebrews writer is encouraging them. You pledge your loyalty. You pledge your allegiance to Jesus. You see, that's our hope. And it's not a hope like we hope when we blow out our birthday candles and we make a wish. It's a hope with this confident expectation that what we believe in Jesus and the cross is true. We expect it, we believe it, because we know it's based upon the promises of God. And we know God is faithful in keeping His promises. And it's because of that there's a choice to be made on where an individual places his allegiance. You know, the truth is there's a lot of things that pull at us in our life for our loyalty. We all have interest and desires, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with enjoying life. In fact, I believe one of the key messages from the book of Ecclesiastes, as the preacher talks about different aspects of life, one of the messages is God wants us to enjoy life. It's just about not making that our ultimate goal, our ultimate purpose. And so there's a lot of things that pull for our attention and our allegiance, but the Hebrews writer says, you be faithful to Christ. And I want you to focus in on this idea, this phrase of holding fast. He says, let us hold fast. Let's go back to chapter 3 in the book of Hebrews. You see, this phrase is a key phrase in the book of Hebrews. Look at chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. As much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. I want you to notice again some of the words that the Hebrews writer uses here. Look at verse 2. Who was faithful? Moses also was faithful. Verse 5, now Moses was faithful. Verse 6, but Christ is faithful. Verse, the end of verse 6. We, if indeed we hold fast our confidence. You see, that word hold fast is nothing more than a synonym for faithful. It's just be faithful. Hold fast. Don't let go. Be faithful. That's the encouragement. And then the Hebrews writer here in chapter 3 would immediately go to an example of a generation that was unfaithful, that first generation that left Egypt, that was there right on the doorsteps, ready to inherit the promised land, but yet they let their fear conquer their faith, and they ultimately were unfaithful and disobedient. Look at the end of chapter 4 with me. Verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, almost identical to what we read in, ver in chapter 10. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Again, almost verbatim from what we read in chapter 10. You see, this idea of holding fast, it's all about being faithful. Be faithful to Christ. Pledge your allegiance to Him. Don't let go. Go back to chapter 10. Let's continue our thoughts from there. 
So the Hebrew writer says in verse 23, Hold fast to the confession of your hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And then beginning in verse 26, he gives a warning too. Just like he had done in chapter 3. Don't be unfaithful, because if you're unfaithful, that has consequences. But look how he closes chapter 10 in verse 39. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. He gives this warning about unfaithfulness. He says, but we're not like that. That's not us. We're not the ones that are going to be unfaithful. We're not the ones that shrink back and are destroyed. Why? Because we're faithful. And then what does he immediately launch into in chapter 11? Examples of people that were faithful. You see, chapter 11 is all about faithfulness. We often refer to it as Faith's Hall of Fame. But every example there are people that were faithful to what God had given them. And here's what's amazing. They weren't perfect. They were faithful. You see, there's a difference between the two. None of us in this room can be perfect. We're going to fail. We're going to make mistakes. Just like the audience, the Hebrews writers writing to, we are going to get discouraged as we try to serve Jesus. It's just a fact of life. But you see, part of the encouragement is this. Even in discouragement, it's possible to be faithful. And that's what all these examples in chapter 11 are. And my favorite part of chapter 11 is the very end where he goes into not the named individuals, but all the unnamed. The people whose names you and I will never know. But yet God knows their names. And God recognizes them because of their faithfulness. You know, none of us in this room, none of our legacy may live on centuries later. But every one of us have a legacy that can live on in heaven. They can live on in God's presence if we will simply just be faithful to Jesus. It doesn't mean perfect. It doesn't mean that we don't get discouraged. It just means that we don't quit and we don't give up. But, you know, sometimes we also need to be encouraged to think about each other. Look at verse 25, verse 24, excuse me. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. I like verse 24. He says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. I think most of you know I grew up in the country on a farm in Georgia. And we used to have this phrase as a kid, we'd go around and say, well, I'm going to go stir something up. Usually it meant we were going to get into some trouble, and we did. But it meant we were going to go do something, right? We weren't just going to sit around and do nothing. We were going to go find something to get into. Here the Hebrews writer is kind of getting to that point, but it's not causing trouble, it's doing something good. We're not just going to be faithful to Jesus. We're not just going to draw near to God and sit back and do nothing. We're going to be out. We're going to be active. We're going to be doing things. And I love what he says. He's, we're, he says, we're going to stir up each other. We're going to get each other fired up. We're going to talk to each other. We're going to encourage each other. For what purpose? Two things, he says, for love and good works. What did Jesus say the world would know us by? Our love for each other. You know, there's a reason that love is most talked about element in all of Scripture. It's because it has to be the foundation of who we are as people. Because you see, we are reflections of God, and God is love. But he says we stir each other to love and good works. You see, that love is not an emotion, it's an action, it's a choice. To get up off of our rear ends and go do something. To go live for Jesus, to be His hands, to be His feet, to be an example to the world around about us. But you know what? That doesn't come easy. We have to be encouraged to do that. How do we do that? We do it, the Hebrews writer says, by not neglecting to meet together. In the context, the Hebrews writer is talking about don't abandon it. Don't walk away from being together. He's not talking about occasionally missing. He's talking about walking away from it altogether. You know, there's a, a bumper sticker I haven't seen in a while, but it used to say, give me Jesus, but not the church. And the principle behind it was, I think, a little bit of this. I think sometimes the people that think that way don't like what they consider to be hypocrisy within the church. And in fairness, sometimes they have a point. 
It's easy to get up and, and preach about serving the needy and loving our enemies and doing those things. It's a lot harder to go out and live it. And so we can't just talk about it. We've got to live it. Because if we don't, then those people have a right to say that about us. But I, I also think there's another element. Sometimes people have this idea that I just want to serve Jesus by myself. That I'll go out and I'll do it in nature. I don't need community. That's, that's just a lie. That's not true. Because you see, that's not how God made us. God made us to live in community. I've been fortunate enough on two occasions to take short-term mission trips to, to Africa. And on both of those times, I was blessed to go on a safari. And on one of those safaris, we were able to watch a herd of lions stalking a herd of wildebeest. And there was this one male lion. It was fascinating. He had this huge mane, but his color blended in perfectly with the tall, dry grass. And so the lions, they would crouch down in this tall brown grass and it all just kind of blended together and the herd of wildebeest had no idea they were even there. And that herd of wildebeest was going about, they were eating. And, and you know how it can happen sometimes. One of those in the herd eventually just became a little bit more separated as he had his head down and was eating and wandering around. Which one of the wildebeest you think that herd of lions started focusing in on? It's the one that started to wander away. Now, I want you to think about that for just a moment. And think about Peter's description of the devil. He's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Who's he more likely to go after? It's when we start to, to wander away. You see, Satan's desire is to separate us from the pack, we might say. That's what Satan wants. Because once we become separated, we become much more easy to discourage. We become much more vulnerable. So the Hebrews writer is reminding his audience, listen, don't pull away from your lifeline of encouragement. But you see, there's a responsibility then that we have as God's people. We have to make sure we're fulfilling that element of encouragement. We need to make sure that when we come into this building that all of us have a, a way to feel encouraged because every time we meet here, I can promise you, Somebody in this audience is discouraged. Somebody is thinking about quitting. Somebody feels like, I don't matter, I'm all alone, and they're ready to walk out that back door. And we, as God's people, have a responsibility to make sure that that never happens to the very best of our ability. So the Hebrews writer says this, Encourage each other to not neglect to meeting together so that you can be an encouragement to one another. Man, that's encouraging, isn't it? God's plan is for us not to walk through this life alone, but to be a part of a community that is encouraging each other to be faithful, to not give up on Jesus, and remind each other that we have this incredible blessing of being able to draw near to God. You know, we're here this morning because it's our desire to do that very thing. We want to draw near to God. We want to be in His presence. We want to be in His throne room. We want to acknowledge Him. We want to worship Him. We're here this morning to encourage each other to be faithful to Jesus. Don't quit. Don't give up if you're discouraged. We're here this morning to encourage each other as God's people. And so this morning's invitation is simply this. It's an invitation of encouragement encouragement that we are here as God's family with the ability to enter the very throne room of God because of the work of the cross and of the blood of Jesus. If you're here this morning and you need to be encouraged for whatever reason, we would love to put our arms around you. We'd love to pray with you. We would love to do whatever we can to be that encouragement to you. This morning's invitation of encouragement is yours. Let us know how we can help you while we stand and sing.